start. Yes, so we'll start now. So, with uh, our sincerest pranams to uh, Revered Maharaj, uh, we are starting the fifth session uh, on uh, Raja Yoga. As Maharaj just mentioned that it is only the introduction, so we are all eagerly waiting for the start of the Raja Yoga sessions and it has been a long gap. Thank you all for joining and Maharaj, a very, very hearty welcome to, uh, to the session in Tatpadam, please. Om Namah Sri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Dhuraya Satchit Sukha Swarupaya Swamine Tapaharine So we are discussing this very interesting book Raj Yoga by Swami Vivekananda after a long time there was a big gap hopefully uh, we will be regular in November and December. Uh, let us hope so. And we'll stick to the schedule. So we'll go back to what we discussed, to recapitulate what we discussed. There is, as I said, an elaborate introduction which uh, Swami Vivekananda wrote. This is, let me remind you what I said in the first class, that this is one of the works of Swami Vivekananda, which was... Uh, so to say written by him or he dictated and somebody else wrote. So it's not a talk that was recorded and transcribed later on. It's not like that or taken down in shorthand as most of his other works are done. I mean were done. Most of them Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, they're all talks delivered at different times and then compiled together. But here you'll find a connection from page one to the last page. In the first part, which is very important to understand Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, is an elaborate introduction Swami Vivekananda gives, explaining the different terms that he is going to use. There will be so many new terms uh, which we will be using. The idea of prana, the idea of kundalini, which is not there in Patanjali's Yoga, but it is <coughs> a tradition which would develop parallelly which is known as Tantra and of course the idea of Prana Swami Vivekananda is taken from the Upanishads which is known as popularly known as Vedanta so from Vedanta from Tantras from also from Patanjali's Yoga which is the main text he has tried to explain in a very synthetic way the different terms which will occur in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras like prana, like uh, chitta vritti, chitta vrittis, and then you will also get a lot of references to different types of samadhi. So what is samadhi? Samadhi is a unique uh, concept which comes in Patanjali's yoga, but nirvikalpa samadhi is there even in uh, Vedanta, and also in Buddhism we speak of nirvana, which is something similar to that. So there are many types of samadhis, which is something which is to be understood. Because when we say samadhi, it can mean so many things, which Patanjali will explain in his uh, in the subsequent chapters. The first chapter is about uh, chitta vritti nirodha. He will start with that. So what they, Patanjali begins with the most fundamental thing that is control of the mind by controlling the thoughts or the waves. Vritti means literally waves. So you may say Vritti means thought waves. So thoughts are just like waves. Uh, when you come to modern physics, modern quantum physics, now we all very well know it is a very common uh, thing which says that uh, matter sometimes exhibit properties of particles and sometimes it becomes a wave. They interchange. So it's very difficult for the modern physicist or the quantum physicist to determine at a particular time whether, mat whether matter is really a particle or a wave. It keeps on changing. So this uncertainty you will find Patanjali has described saying that thoughts are also something like fine matter. 
the gross universe that you see is nothing but an expression of that fine matter which is thought. So thoughts are also, uh, they assume waveform. That is why every thought is considered to be a vritti. Vritti means a wave. So the idea that matter and thought are similar in the sense, both exhibit the nature of waves. Though matter sometimes, because it is gross, it assumes the nature of a particle, but not for long. Modern physics, modern quantum physics has shown very clearly that the moment you try to identify the particle, the smallest particle or the smallest com uh, constituent of the atom, it simply vanishes and you just find a wave instead. So energy and mass gets interconverted which is one of the most important ideas much long before Einstein and others uh, discovered the principle of conversion of matter into energy and energy into matter, E is equal to mc square. But long, long, long before that, I mean, at least several years before that, Swamiji in his Raj Yoga very clearly explains the interconvertibility of matter into uh, force or energy, thought energy is one of the energies, and energy into matter. So the equation came much later, Swamiji in fact in one of the uh, one of the passages he says something very significant at least 20 years before Einstein actually formulated his, or 20, 25 years before that. The very principle that if any uh, anything moves with the speed of light, say any particle, if it moves faster than the speed of light, its mass increases. That is what E is equal to mc square stands for, when c is the velocity of light. So much before that, Swami Vivekananda makes a statement which anticipates this theory. He says, you see the spider's web he uses a very fragile uh, material which is known, which we can encounter, that is a spider's web. It is so flimsy, so uh, weak, but he says through his intuition, you see, see his intuition, how he anticipated the theory of increase of mass with the increase of velocity. So he says in his Raj Yoga introduction, we will come to that passage. He says, if does, if somehow we move this spider's, a thread of the spider's web, one of the threads of the spider's web, and increase the speed so so much that it travels faster than the speed of light, he says it will become stronger than a steel wire. Now it is something which in those days people would have just laughed because they these discoveries were made much later, this equation which uh, Einstein uh, and others later on, all the quantum physicists accept that the matter increases if the wave energy or the wave travels with a speed faster than the speed of light. So in E is equal to mc square, c is the speed of light. So with that equation, uh, the famous equation, Einstein has tried to prove that if anything moves, and it is possible because when you go into the subatomic, uh, we think speed of light is the highest possible speed in the visible universe. But when you go into the micro universe, you will find the speed of light, there, there are particles traveling far faster than that. And that is how they grow. They grow in mass. So mass and energy, they are interconvertible. So in taking that idea, uh, Swami Vivekananda says that if a spider's web, a, a, a thread of a spider's web travels faster, somehow it travels faster than the speed of light, it can become as strong because the mass will increase, it will become very strong, it will become stronger than the wire of steel. This is something unique, how he anticipated it, is just by the power of intuition the, uh, these discoveries were made. So now let us come to the methodology he uses. This Raj Yoga was a book he specifically wrote for the Western people who swore by science because all dogmatic religions were crumbling to pieces. 
especially in England, because of this revolution in the scientific methodology and scientific thought, they said if you cannot prove anything scientifically, then all these dogmas have no value because why should we take all these uh, concepts which religious uh, leaders of the church and all the different religious denominations ask us to believe blindly. They are dogmas unless they can be established in a scientific way. The principles of science which the methodology of science was very well known when Swami Vivekananda visited England and there were a lot of philosophers like Bertrand Russell and others who said why should we believe in any religion just because some prophet or somebody says so. Can we not test religion, the religious truth, the spiritual truth, not the religious truth, the spiritual truth as we test the scientific truths? We reject. Science is open to change. Science is open to correction. It never says this is the ultimate truth. So when modern physics and quantum physics came, Newtonian physics which applied to certain systems, subsystems, did not work in the uh, a micro universe. So quantum physics came and they changed the laws, they changed many things based on experimental evidence and that is the scientific spirit. So you have to go this quest, this quest which we undertake in the field of spirituality is as authentic or uses the same methodology as science. That is what we discussed in the previous class. But the difference is between empirical science, discoveries of empirical science. But let me tell you, it's not always true that all empirical sciences, all the discoveries of empirical sciences were done in the laboratory. Sometimes they were done by the power of intuition. As you see, there are so many scientists who acknowledge, even the famous professor Ramanujam, who, who simply people did not believe how he came with all these equations. Because he said, it is the Divine Mother who uh, inspires me to write all these things. And his professor Hardy could not believe this fact. That how, can a, uh, uh, how can a God or how can a deity which he believes, which he worships can reveal? But the fact is that these equations were put before uh, the scientific community and they were accepted. Now after many years, slowly they are trying to prove it and all of these equations are found to be correct. So he used, like any other scientist, many scientists have acknowledged the fact that in some deeply meditative state, the intuitive faculty gave them solutions which they would not have arrived at through rational thinking. Of course, afterwards they proved it. So everybody from Einstein and all the modern physicists, quantum physicists, somehow they discover these truths intuitively and then later on it comes like a flash. So this power of intuition which Patel and Patanjali uh, introduced in Raj Yoga, Swami Vivekananda also speaks about that and he tells very clearly that the power of intuition, of course one has to be very rational. One has to follow reason as long as uh, uh, you can. That is the scientific method. You should not do anything unreasonable. Just any dogma, just any uh, word you should not take on face value. You have to experiment it as far as possible. But the experiments that you do in Raj Yoga or in Patanjali's Yoga, Swamiji says, is, not, is somewhat different. The methodology is same, but the instruments are different. The In scientific method, we have many equipment. Sometimes we have uh, logic, we have analytical skills, which we develop mathematical skills through which we can prove certain theories, or prove certain postulates, which later on become theories. There is a definite method to prove it. But what are the instruments that <coughs> Raj Yoga uses? That is the question. So here it is only the mind. Mind itself is the instrument through which the mind has to be studied. 
it's difficult to understand how can the instrument study itself. That is possible only in a human being through the power known as buddhi. So this idea of buddhi is very very common in Vedanta, though Patanjali also mentions that. So when the mind is concentrated, when it becomes more subtle, the manas becomes buddhi. We discussed the four aspects of the mind, let us not discuss it again. The manas, which is the reactive mind, which is a very crude mind, though it can develop lot of skills, IT skills, computers, I mean uh, scientific skills, it, it is the manas uh, has a great role to play, play in our secular education. There's no doubt, it has to be skilled. But higher than manas is this intuitive faculty which scientists sometimes use when the truths are revealed to them in a flash, it is known as buddhi. It is the final aspect of the mind. It is the mind of uh, what is known as mind in Western psychology. The same mind has been divided into four parts. The two important being one is manas. One classification is manas is the lower mind, a reactive mind, where we see certain things and our mind reacts. Even animals have that kind of mind. But human beings have a higher faculty which leads to the power of intuition if it is developed in the uh, developed by the sadhaka using the techniques explained by Patanjali or the other Vedantic technique. Swamiji has combined all the techniques, Vedanta, Tantra, in fact the whole mantra sadhana in our Ramakrishna tradition because they ask when people come for initiation, they ask this fact, which system do you follow? So our answer is, it is Vivekananda's or Ramakrishna's system, where a synthesis of all the ancient Indian thought is combined in a one particular method. You cannot call it just Patanjali's yoga. You cannot call it Vedantic uh, uh, dharana, uh, or not dharana, it is known as uh, Nididhyasana. In Vedanta there is Shravana, listening, understanding, Manana, understanding, and then deeply deliberating, uh, deeply meditating on that which is known as Nididhyasana. So the system of meditation which is taught in the Ramakrishna order is a synthesis of Nididhyasana of the Vedanta, the wonderful meditation techniques and including the concept of Kundalini, which is given in the Shakti Puja or Shakti Worship, which is also known as Tantra, which is an independent philosophy developed along with Sankhya, Vedanta and Patanjali's Yoga. Yoga is based on Sankhya philosophy. So Yoga uses Dhyan, Dharana, so it is the same. It is almost the same, but explained in different ways. And combining all this, Swami Vivekananda comes to a synthetic philosophy of Ra, what he calls Raj Yoga. Raj Yoga doesn't mean the technical word Raj Yoga. You have to remember this. Many people, if you Google, you will find Raj Yoga is something, a part of Hatha Yoga, which is not the Raj Yoga of Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda was very particular when he gave the word name Raj Yoga to Patanjali, his explanation of Patanjali's Yoga. He, Raja means kingly, the most kingly knowledge. Kingly in the sense, it is it is a royal way of doing sadhana. So when you follow a royal approach, that means it is the best. It is an approach which will lead you to the goal very easily. And for that, he had to combine Vedanta, he had to combine some of the ideas of Shakti Puja or Tantras, which is what Bija is in the... Uh, Ramakrishna tradition, Bija Mantra, which is part of the main mantra. And then we have the Patanjali's yoga techniques, which form the basis of Jnana Yoga or Raj Yoga as Swami. So, uh, remembering this, I am just recapitulating because we discussed this in the first four classes. This is the fifth one. But here we will see that the scientific approach has to be used. But here, the instruments are the mind itself. Even the indriyas do not come to your help. Because indriyas are gross instruments. The eye, the ear, 
we may use it to a certain extent but then we have to have a higher instrument which is known as buddhi or the mind so a mind which is evolved a mind which is trained a mind which is trained through concentration and the only way to do it is to reduce the chitta vrittis because as long as the vrittis come and disturb you cannot reach the level of buddhi buddhi is a vedantic concept but patanjali says very clearly says without dharana without pratyahara of course asanas and all much lower they are just the basic things of yoga people make such a big fuss about asana all asana does in our life is make our body steady so that we can concentrate better that's the only function of asana according to patanjali all the other asanas are physical exercises they may be necessary for improving the body but they will not help in yoga the pranayama and the asanas which patanjali describes just help they are the steps the most preliminary steps which will help us in concentrating the mind and controlling the mind so the real patanjali yoga starts from step number 5 onwards first four yama niyama pranayama and asana are preliminary we make such a big fuss about yoga yoga has become so popular but they are just the preliminary steps leading to the real yoga which is which begins with the fifth step there are eight steps pratyahara we will we'll see how swami ji explains later on pratyahara dharana then comes meditation dhyana which is the seventh step so you can't just jump to this seventh step that is why meditation is difficult for most of us and then comes samadhi of course that is the goal of meditation but as swami ji says how do we do it in a scientific way not because patanjali says patanjali also does not ask us to believe he says every step you try you try yama you try niyama that is the basic discipline to even enter into a meditative life rajoga the yama niyama cannot be ignored so if you don't have a disciplined life if you uh, don't prepare yourself for even asana and pranayama pranayama and asana are third and fourth steps in patanjali yoga before that he gives the elaborate list which we will discuss of course so this yama and niyama the internal and external control of the whole personality not just the mind the body because we begin with the body after having done the preliminary control the restless body is quiet and then we use asana to make the body steady sitting quietly is one of the most difficult tasks for restless children you must have seen that is why sometimes we feel bad but we have to tell our devotees here please do not bring your children to a meditation sessions or meditation and talk you can't blame the children because they have not been trained to trained in yama and niyama forget asana asana and pranayama is a much higher spiritual practice according to patanjali yama and niyama itself the rules the disciplinary rules which tame the restless body and the restless mind because it begins with the body it begins with the gross and then we come to the mind so trying to control the mind without controlling the body is ridiculous so that is why swami ji will discuss in so many pages what is this yama and niyama why it is important why it is important especially for our young children so that they get a chance to study their body before they attempt to study the mind and then we blame they don't have concentration how can they have dharana and dhyana and uh, even pratyahara if they don't have the first they have not followed the first four steps so asana means sitting in a position <coughs> for a comparatively long period of time which is decreasing now the attention span is decreasing the most difficult you can possibly tell a child is to sit quietly for say 10 minutes forget 10 uh, one hour 
to attend a class or a talk, you need to sit steadily for one hour, which is not even possible for adults. They have to do some activity, movement here and there. And for children to imagine that, to imagine being able to sit quietly, if they have not been trained in the first two steps, then which leads to asana, and then once they are steady in their body, then pranayama is the second stage where the body, once it is a bit steady, the prana becomes steady. Our prana is also now uh, not uh, in a steady state. It is so restless, the prana actually disturbs the body. And also the mind on the other side, because, because it is sandwiched between the mind and the body. So Patanjali says, first do asana, first yama, niyama, asana, and when the body is steady, when you, through self-discipline, through certain self-imposed discipline, discipline should not be en uh, uh, enforced from outside, otherwise people will rebel, children will rebel. If you explain the need, why it is absolutely necessary to succeed in any mental activity, concentration, and of course spiritual life. For any success in any kind of life dealing with the mind, the body should be steady. The prana should be steady. So Patanjali and Vivekananda will, almost one third of the book is about studying the, uh, not one third, one third of the sutras. You will find so many sutras on why, uh, how to deal with this mind at the preliminary level, what are the prerequisites, what are the yamas and niyamas and which leads to asana. Asana is very simple, the definition is thiram sukham asana. Thira sukham, thiram sukham asana. Means that which keeps you steady is asana, nothing beyond that. The, all the other asanas are just ornamental asanas which help us to uh, improve our the flow of prana in the body so that our health, we become healthy. That is invaluable, no doubt. But it has nothing to do with Patanjali's yoga. Very, It is very clear. So, you have to find out through a process of reasoning in a very scientific way how we can step by step practice this Raj Yoga. Now as I said, like chemistry and astronomy, where you use external instruments to study the space outside, to study the materials outside, it's very easy because the thing is outside of you. Whereas if you focus, you use the mind, your own higher mind to study the lower mind, it is a very challenging task, which has to be uh, done in a very scientific way. Patanjali doesn't say just believe and do this, do this, do that, uh, just like any commandment which any religion will say, you have to do this, you have to do that. No. He says do this and see it will lead you to this. Then you do this, it will lead you to this. So every step is scientific. How to use the instruments, the internal instruments, the lower mind, so that the higher man can take control and then guide you to all the steps of pratyara, dhyana, dharana, dharana and dhyana, leading to samadhi. All, everything has been scientifically explained. But internal concentration is more difficult. That is why the first thing you are asked to do when you start your meditative life is to focus on the ishta or the god or the deity within your heart. All the time we have been worshipping God outside. It is very easy. We go to a photo, offer some fruits, offer some, do some puja and then be happy that you have done a great spiritual uh, exercise. But the real challenge comes when you sit down and try to bring that same deity within. That is the first step, Patanjali says, uh, of Swami Vivekananda says in his introduction, to practice internal concentration. External, we have a lot of external concentration. All the children or the whole education system is to train a child for external concentration, to concentrate on his subject, to concentrate on his methodology, to concentrate on the things around him, to investigate. So that we are used to it. 
But even a grown up scientist becomes a pygmy when he tries to do, use the same methodology to study the internal nature because the instruments are different. The laboratory is different. A approach is same, but the instruments are different. So he, he, every one of us, when we finally decide to follow spiritual life, we are asked to go to the spiritual laboratory and change not the methodology, but external concentration has to be converted into internal concentration. The visualization is not inside out, but outside in. Everything has to be focused inside, which is a big challenge because you are going against the current. If you, if you are going with the current, that is how the world has taught us. All our education is going with the current, like going with the current. Everything is taught, mathematics, physics, chemistry, geography. These are external sciences at which we, are, we have great skills. But when you tell that same person, no matter how many PhDs he has got, to just sit quietly and practice a simple exercise in internal concentration. Normally it happens when you ask the person to close his eyes and try to visualize the same deity which he all, the, all through his life he has just visited temples or churches and prayed to a god who is outside. Now suddenly the guru or the yogic teacher will tell you all this is not going to help you. The same god you are worshipping outside has to be brought inside. And when you focus on him, you know how difficult it is. It is like starting from kindergarten again. The whole education has to be gone through again. So it is a re-education into spiritual life. That was, that is what Patanjali says, Swamiji says, the development of the intuitive faculty which comes from buddhi. This training of the buddhi ought to have been taught to us, ought to have been, it is not taught. At the age of as early as 6 to 8, that is when the Gayatri Mantra or the Upanayana is done. Simultaneously with external concentration, the child is taught, not a grown up man, it is very difficult after a certain age to uh, reverse uh, our focus. But the child can easily do it when it is growing up. So at the age of between 6 and 8, the idea of developing the buddhi or developing internal concentration along with external concentration is taught, is supposed to be taught. That was the wonderful system of education and the guru would tell him that this is Guru or the father who gives the Gayatri Mantra, you focus on that intuitive faculty. Without that instrument, you may succeed in a secular life because your external concentration is going to develop anyway. We will teach you all the subjects, how to earn money through skills, how to earn a living through skills. But nobody is going to teach you this internal concentration, which is necessary if you want to develop spiritual, uh, start a spiritual life. Forget uh, becoming an expert in spirituality. To even start, the basic fundamental need is to understand that there is a way of internal concentration. So you think, Swamiji says, you think, and as it were, another part of your own mind watches your thoughts. This is known as mindfulness in uh, Buddhist meditation. In Buddhist meditation, they say, be mindful. Mindful of what? Mindful of your own thought. You start with the body, you are mindful of your body, you are mindful of the breath, breath. you are mindful of many things. Then slowly they, you graduate to be mindful of your own thoughts, which is the most difficult thing, which is what Patanjali's yoga is all about. How to be mindful of your own thought. So, first of all, to practice this internal concentration, or the internal quest for knowledge as opposed to the external quest for knowledge which leads to science, economics and all the secular sciences. There are certain basic qualifications. Just as you need to be uh, a high school pass out to go to a college and then you, from university you have, there are so many qualifications. So also 
in this yoga there are people who have to have some basic qualification what are the basic qualification first of all who can follow this in a uh, uh, in the present day competitive world there are so many conditions before you can become a doctor before you can choose any profession there are so many prerequisites here it is not like that here whether you are a university graduate or an uneducated illiterate village uh, person who has never gone to school all are eligible there is no eligibility criteria if the will is there to show that sri ram krishna was born swami ji says sri ram krishna was born to show that in this university the university where spiritual truths are discovered you don't have any eligibility criteria you don't you have to go through all the stages but anybody who can think can be eligible that is one thing irrespective of his faith and belief whether is a christian muslim or hindu it doesn't matter which part of the world or which ethnicity uh, you belong to then second criteria is patience uh, patanjali is famous sutra is there nirantara dirga kala that is you have to be patiently after it of course to even get a uh, post graduate degree how much patience you need you can't just say i'll go and join the college and get a post graduate degree you have to go through the kindergarten you have to go through all the stages and we don't mind that we don't mind our children going through that but if you say that meditation is difficult you have to practice for a long time to get some mastery to go to school level the school final level uh, so many years are required and you expect the spirituality to be done in a single day it doesn't happen so long time patience a uh, patience to practice for a long time and constantly not doing now and then you can't go to school for a few days and then skip you have to continuously go we are we are forced to follow a certain routine for a long time before we can even pass out from school pass out from university do phd do research and then that is how we advance now one more quality is required which swami vivekananda points out i am just giving the points so very elaborately is discussed discussed it says this in this training it it is partly physical that is asana yama niyama but mainly it is mental so this has to be attempted by people who have a strong mind or a steady mind though it is not a essential qualification even people with restless mind if they are really earnest even the most restless child can be made quiet if there is a persistence and these things are practiced over a long time swami sri ram krishna is to give a wonderful example the most unruly dog was not obeying the master is so and it was just jumping on his lap and just he was fondling it and spoiling the child actually spoiling the young dog the young dog then a guest comes to that house and he tells him this is the wrong approach you have spoiled the dog you have just allowed him to go anywhere do anything he likes you have to slowly discipline that dog every time it jumps on your lap give it a nice slap then it understands after 10 or 12 attempts it will stop doing similarly all its restlessness should be removed by disciplines sri ram krishna gives this very crude example but very effective example how to train our mind it's not just training the children even adults need training so to train this you have to be persistent these are the few qualifications which swami ji has given it is partly physical but most of it is mental there should be this will there should be this desire ichha shakti gyan shakti first the knowledge part of uh, mental power it is known as gyan shakti which we discussed in the class yesterday we were discussing uh, vedanta and the science of human possibilities which we do every alternate saturday in that class uh, there is a beautiful description in vivek chudamani where uh, shankaracharya says there is this 
I mean, it, it is there in many Prakarana Granthas, including Vedanta Sara. So, where three faculties of the mind, thinking, uh, that is Jnana Shakti, then feeling, that is Icha Shakti, the desire to do something, and Kriya Shakti, that is the willpower. So, the good intentions may be there, good thoughts may be there, that I will practice yoga, I will practice meditation. But that it has to be the emotion or the emotional attachment to this idea should increase so that your Icha Shakti also increases along with the Jnana Shakti. And then when finally these two combine, these are strong, then your Kriya Shakti will manifest. Then you will really go and sit for meditation, maybe for 15 minutes, and then your Icha Shakti has to increase. Then the Kriya Shakti, the willpower will increase. And that is how you slowly uh, discipline yourself. So, though the, we begin with physical training in yoga, Patanjali's yoga, Pranayama is also physical, partly physical, because there you are breathing, you are controlling the breath. But after that, it is all mental. It is all mind, dealing with the lower mind with the help of the higher mind. Who, this is a very wonderful distinction which is there in yoga philosophy. The buddhi, it is there in Vedanta as well, in tantras also it is there. Controlling the lower mind with the higher mind. So these are the instruments. The higher mind, the buddhi is the instrument through which you control the manas, the restless mind. So, though they are independent, see, it is very difficult to even imagine that how can they be independent of each other? They are independent, just as the leg is independent of the head. Though they act in coordination, all our organs are independent. I see something, but you see, when we think, we have all these things are happening simultaneously. You are seeing, you are hearing at the same time. But... Each one is independent. So also, the different faculties of the mind, the manas does its job. It does its job in a particular way as it has been trained. But the buddhi says, no, you are wrong. You should not be doing this. Or you should be doing this or you should not be doing this. That discriminative faculty is typical of buddhi. So the higher mind, that is one more aspect you have to remember, the instrument is the lower mind and the organ and the body, but the person who is controlling, the higher instrument is the higher mind or buddhi. So buddhi controls the lower. So the, he, Swami Vivekananda now discusses a wonderful scientific principle which says, the scientific principle which he uh, the most important principle or law you can say of this Patanjali's science of Patanjali's yoga is the finer the subtle is stronger than the gross the buddhi controls the mind not the mind that controls the buddhi so whatever is finer whatever is more subtle controls the gross in its effect so the internal is the cause that is the second uh, postulate or theory. Swamiji says, the internal mind, it is the mind which gives rise to the jnana, then it becomes icha, then it becomes action. So internal is the cause of the external, that is the second law. First is final controls the grosser. Mind controls the body, not the other way around. Then, both are material. That is a great discovery which quantum physics did only recently, few uh, decades ago. That mind and matter, I mean mind, they have not yet come to the idea of mind. But matter and energy are interconvertible. Here, they knew long ago, not only matter and energy, the Annamai Kosha and the Pranamai Kosha, they have the impact on each other and they influence each other. But also the lower mind has an influence on the higher, uh, higher mind has an influence on the lower mind. Lower mind can control the prana, the 
subsequently it can control the body and then so many the gross things can be controlled our actions can be controlled only by controlling the mind that is another law whatever one and the other law is one who controls the inner controls the outer and the yogi's goal is to <coughs> control the inner so you see how as a science Patanjali or Swami Vivekananda's interpretation of Patanjali's yoga, where he combines the best traditions of yoga, the best traditions of uh, tantras, and also Vedanta, he takes ideas from different streams of thought, which have developed in India, and combines them into a wonderful philosophy of Raj Yoga, where, in a very scientific way, this is one of the most scientific approaches to. religion ever attempted the the uh, he himself says in the introduction before leaving the west because he was in the midst of some of the greatest stalwarts of science who were rebelling against traditional religion churches were closing down the traditional religion he himself says they were broken by this reformists or the uh, scientists just as they break china clay porcelain all big towers of religion were crumbling to pieces that's the word he uses by the <clears throat> by the striking of this uh, thought of the scientific approach to life so definitely swami ji appreciated that and he believed that if this similar approach the same methodology is used in the religion then we will get true spirituality and before leaving the west he gave a lot of talks in london on uh, gyana yoga which have been compiled he also gave a lot of talks karma yoga in new york and other places we have three wonderful books i am not saying they are not important gyana yoga is equally important bhakti yoga is very important also karma yoga is important but one of the most important works he himself dictated he wrote you can say he wrote he edited was this raj yoga because he said i don't want to leave this country without giving them giving people of both east and the west mainly the western people western by western i mean people who are uh, devoted to science or the scientific methodology as the supreme way to solve the problems of life he said without giving them something concrete in the form of a philosophy or a book it would be <clears throat> not nice to leave this western world he was in a hurry he knew he did not have much life left so in 1896 he saw that this book was published first from london and then from new york he was very particular both the editions they have slight differences but most of it was edited by swami sharada anand ji because he did not have much time but anyway whichever edition we follow like the karma yoga this was one of his important books which he wanted to leave as a permanent record of what he said in the west so he established a scientific approach to religion as he understood from our traditions of vedanta tantras from which he has taken wonderfully the idea of kundalini the idea of prana which is not patanjali's idea he has taken it from the vedanta and also patanjali's own wonderful scientific approach to spiritual life he has combined all the three and left behind a book which is one of the most valuable contributions ever to human thought even william james was so much impressed the western psychologist because this is a book which if studied it will satisfy everyone so he is trying to say that the instruments of science which led to such wonderful discoveries are external but here it is internal and he showed also how internal instruments can be used in this process of self discovery so this methodology is not different only the laboratory changes the instruments changes and the focus changes that is why again i repeat he says the difference between the east and west in those days now it is no longer a monopoly of the east in fact western people are also taking to this patanjali's yoga in a very big way 
So he says some races try, but in fact now we are so much after controlling the external nature. So we have inherited lot of Western qualities now. So now that is why our magazine, which was earlier named as Vedanta for the East and the West, we removed it because it doesn't make any sense now. The world has become globalized. Eastern people are becoming more Westernized, and Western people are trying to become Easternized in the sense. Their approaches are different, as Swamiji says. Some races try to control the external. It was true during his time, but now I don't think it is any longer valid, because you'll find increasing number of Indians just trying to imitate, control the external, which is a good thing. He didn't say controlling the external is not necessary. He said Indians have to be practical. They have to be scientific in the external sense, rather than being scientific. They were obsessed with the internal science. The huge difference between the approaches, leading the same scientific methodology used by Western science is being used by by Swami Vivekananda here, trying to explain how the internal science of religion, which is spirituality or yoga, will lead us to the same goal. That is why he says. Some try to control the external, <clears throat> whichever race it is. They are known as materialists because they want to control the external. They think they will control everything by controlling the external. And when they are disappointed, they find that without controlling the internal, we cannot control the external. And then, but one great thing Swamiji says that this idea of mind and matter. Influencing each other, and basically they are made of the same substance, which Sankhya says, which yoga follows. Sankhya is the basis of yoga philosophy. Sankhya and yoga are always together. So Sankhya says mind and matter are one. This is one important thing he says. Mind, if matter can influence the mind, it is more true that mind can influence matter because mind is more subtle. So these are the six, five or six laws which we discussed of. A scientific approach to spiritual life. What spirituality is, and India, he says, very surprisingly, we have to st- still do research to find out how. He says India discovered this fact long ago. Whether you go on external quest, which leads to science, but you have to be very honest and go to its ultimate logical conclusion. And whether you go use the internal instruments and approach science, the scientific methodology by going inwards, it is the same. It will lead to the same goal, which is something which is very unique. If one is truthful, even a scientist will reach the same levels of intuition. As I said, most of the discoveries were made with the faculty of buddhi being awakened. If Buddha was not awakened, they would not get intuitive solutions to even material problems. So mind and matter, it's just a perspective, different perspective. But the methodology doesn't change, the approach doesn't change. And Swamiji says India is the only country which found the unity between matter and mind, between external quest and uh, internal quest, but only for a few centuries. Focus was more on internal quest, as a result of which we became poor externally, economically and otherwise, because we were more interested in internal science. So there should be a balance. Now east and west are more or less balanced. So now these ideas which he uh, wrote hundred years ago, they have changed a little bit. So there is no east and west, but approaches. If you are Focus on internal control, internal science. Then you are uh, spiritual, or you may say Eastern in your approach. Though East and West doesn't make any sense, but even if you are living in the East and following external science, excellence in external science, then you are a Westerner by Swamiji's definition. So now he says this: the basis of this idea. I'll conclude with this. Is Sankhya philosophy. We have to understand this, because there is no yoga, Patanjali yoga, without Sankhya. And Sankhya, many more year, many much before, uh, even Tesla and uh, scientists like Einstein and all, when they 
try to find out the correlation between matter and whether it is a matter is has a nature of a particle or a wave. Sankhya's had understood this long, long ago. They say external objects. The outer organs have a corresponding internal organ. Everything has an internal aspect to it. So you can't control the external without controlling the internal. As I said, that is one of the important laws. Swamiji, like a uh, scientific, uh, as a scientist, has given all these laws of the internal quest. The, sci the quest for internal science of yoga. It is a science. Patanjali also says it is a science. There are steps, there are different stages, and everybody can practice this, just as science is open to anyone, irrespective of his caste, creed, religion, ethnicity. Every, everybody can study science. Science does not make any distinction. There is no adhikari. But here the adhikari, as I said, one of the most important qualifications is it is open to all. Everybody from a university professor to a person who has never gone to school can study eternal science. There is no admission test or anything. But the patience, the idea which Swamiji says, for a long time, patiently one has to practice this. Then this intuitive faculty, because the whole intuitive faculty is awakened this is a science. By repeated practice of some sadhana, some thought, some mantra, some kind of meditation. So you can't just say that it is not scientific. If we practice it, or if any aspirant practices it, whether he follows the path of yoga, tantra, or vedanta, practice, repetition is very important. Yesterday we discussed this in the Saturday class. The four aspects, such a beautiful explanation Vedanta Sara has given. The four aspects of the mind. One is known as Smriti, repetitive thought. Though understanding is important, but after understanding you have to repeat. In Vedanta it is known as Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shavana is the, first you have to hear, then you have to meditate on what you heard. After having analyze it, meditate and rationally analyze it, then you give up reason. Then you have to be after it. You have to do nididhyasana, that is meditation. Same thing Patanjali will also say. Pratyara to dharana, dharana to dhyana, dhyana to samadhi. So in every case, we have to have long, it has to be practiced for long, practiced constantly through repetitive Practice. Repetition is only to overemphasize and to make it established. So this study, this persistence is necessary in external science also. If you see these great discoveries, these scientists like Newton and many other scientists, they didn't give up the effort. Edison, for example, he says uh, when he failed 999 times and the thousand times he was successful in discovering that lamp, the filament for the lamp, Somebody said, you failed 999 times. He said, at least these 999 times I failed, I knew what will not work till I found the filament that really works. So failure is natural. One has to be patient till the discovery is made, whether it is external or internal. So the Sankhya philosophy, which is the basis which we'll discuss, there, there are different aspects. We can't, we don't have much time. We'll leave the session open for question answers if there are any. Uh, because this will take some time. Because what I said, what Swamiji analyzed and gave as axioms to follow spiritual life, they are taken from Sankhya. Sankhya discusses very clearly, uh, gives the philosophy for the practice of Patanjali's yoga. Yoga and Sankhya are two schools of thought which are connected to each other. Philosophical part is Sankhya and the practical part or the uh, uh, practical part, experimental part is Yoga. So shall we uh, leave the session open if there are questions? Yes Maharaj, if there are questions, but uh, thank you Maharaj uh, for today's session. Team, any questions? There are a few questions on yeah. YouTube and Zoom. 
No, no, you can take uh, those questions. Take the YouTube zone. Okay, yes. question is very important uh, it is very interesting as well Swamiji has mentioned and I'll tell you where he has mentioned this Swamiji has mentioned that this Raj Yoga should be practiced one to one uh, th that is not actually factually correct Raj Yoga is a very big subject the Raj Yoga of Vivekananda not the Raj Yoga of but the part of Hatha Yoga, which is also known as Raj Yoga in some schools of yoga. I am not talking of that. I am talking of Vivekananda Saraj Yoga. Though he says it is to be practiced one to one when it comes to meditation. But specifically, he has mentioned this one to one thing when you practice Pranayama. He has said, for other things, he has not said this. If you read the Raj Yoga properly, when he discusses pranayama, he has given two pranayama exercises and he has warned saying that if you want to practice other forms of pranayama, as people are enthusiastic, they perform different asanas for physical health. You don't go to XYZ person and learn asana. You have to go to a qualified person. Similarly, for pranayama, he said, I am giving you simple two breathing techniques which he says you can just by reading the book and the way I tell you you practice that is safe it's not going to harm you but any other pranayama complicated pranayama which is part of Hatha Yoga it's not actually part of Patanjali's Yoga it is an addition so it is known as Hatha Yoga for Hatha Yoga he said you have to have a one to one with a guru who knows what pranayama is and who has practiced it for a long time. Otherwise, when you are playing with this force, it is like playing with electricity. If you can't control the voltage and the uh, different uh, uh, the wires, you don't have the necessary equipment, it can just lead to shocks. So also he says prana is like an electric force, prana. The prana means the uh, vital forces which run the body. So you can't just practice anything and everything by reading books or listening to videos or something. And you may land yourself. Many of the pra practitioners of not so much of asana. Asana, they may cripple their body, but the mind at least is saved. But pranayama can have a very big impact on the mental uh, in thoughts because prana is very near to the manomaya kosha. The pranamaya kosha, according to Vedanta, is very connected to the both the mind and the body, but more with the mind. So if there is any defect without a guru, that's why they say without a proper practitioner. It's not a question of guru, but it's a question of a practitioner who knows the science of pranayama and he has practiced for a long time. Without that, you should not do. So your question that uh, one should not practice Raj Yoga is not true. One should not practice Pranayama. In that context, he has said, it should be one to one. And also, in general, in our tradition, you need a guru for everything. Raj Yoga, in, in general, there are many things which any, everybody and anybody can practice. But if you have a specific requirement, like spiritual development, then also they say it is better to follow an established tradition where a lot of aspirants have traditionally practiced it and the knowledge has been handed over from the guru to the disciple and because it has been traditionally proven it has been proven without doubt that great spiritual stalwarts were born in this tradition that is why the need for a guru if you want to follow that particular tradition you go to the expert or the authority who has been empowered to carry that tradition forward. That is another aspect which is not discussed in Raj Yoga, but Swamiji mentions it elsewhere. Why this tradition, spirituality has to be learnt 
just as you go to Oxford, because you know the tradition of Oxford is very good for secular knowledge, the way they approach the subject. You don't go to X, XYZ University. So also you have to be very careful when you select a tradition which has a proven uh, record in this research, spiritual research. It's just like a research uh, university. Spirituality, the tradition, the Shankaracharya's tradition, different traditions of yoga, uh, with authentic traditions. I am talking of authentic traditions. So you need to ask the follower of that tradition or whoever wants to become a guru, whether there is a tradition behind him, where is the source, who is the source person, and how has the knowledge been transmitted. You don't go to Oxford and uh, believe every, uh, that there will be a professor who is not qualified teaching you, because you know there is a tradition, they won't accept anyone and everyone to teach. Other lesser universities might do that. So also in this tradition, you have to be a bit careful. In that way it is careful, but why should it deter you or deter the person who is asking the question from following Raj Yoga? Raj Yoga, only thing Swamiji says is specifically for Pranayama, but if you want other things other than Pranayama, which we don't teach, by the way, uh, Ramakrishna tradition, we don't emphasize because that is not part of the tradition. This pranayama, our emphasis on asanas and pranayama is not part of our tradition. Whatever is basic and required for meditating, we start from step number five onward: pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. And then along with that, there is a little of Vedanta in this Raj Yoga, and a lot of Kundalini or the philosophy of Shakti tantras. So. All this put together, of course, has to uh, be taken from a, as this advice or the practice has to be taken from a tradition, then one is safe. Any more questions? Not from here, Maharaj, but... Uh... Okay. Yeah, so next month onwards, we'll try to be regular. Yes. Uh, so you can. So th thank you, uh, Maharaj. And uh, uh, there is one more question. Just one sure, more sure. question here. Yeah. There are some people sitting here in front. So Human mind is impossible 
You cannot say that a person is only rational, he is not emotional. He will have little emotion, may not have much bhakti, but he will have. And no person, according to Swamiji, uh, no spiritual person or spiritual aspirant can be one who is restless. That is one great uh, uh, thought which Rajoga gives that restless, anything, restlessness can be controlled through bhakti. That is different. You have a personal God, you worship him and that restlessness changes into devotion to a particular God. Karma Yoga also, when you do yoga, karma su kaushalam, when you do, try to do very skillfully the job that he has been allotted to you, your concentration increases. The mind becomes less restless. A restless mind cannot work properly. So karma yoga is also not possible. Then you take jnana yoga. Obviously, if you sit reading a book, trying to understand Vedanta, which is so difficult, that with a restless mind, you will have to read it over and over again, over and over again, to even understand what it says. So, restlessness of mind, the Raj Yoga, that is why Swamiji says, it is like a rudder. He gives a beautiful example. It is like a bird. Karma and Bhakti are the two wings. Jnana is the one who gives the direction. And the rudder is the Raj Yoga. That is, concentration of mind is common. Without the rudder, without the tail, the bird will not be able to control the direction of the flight. So, wings are necessary. So, all parts of the bird are necessary. That is how one can reconcile. So, shall we conclude? Yes, Maharaj, pronounce to you. Our next class as per session should be 17th October. Closer to the date, we, that's the third Sunday. Closer to the okay. date, we will look at it if uh, we need to change. I think it should be okay. But I will inform on what's yes. yeah. up. Pranam Maharaj. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu Thank you.